Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soul scientist on this channel. I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants. And in today's video, we're gonna be talking about the difference between coconut acquire and peat moss. If you've been on this channel long enough, you know that I reviewed peat moss and I reviewed coconut acquire. I went into the science behind both products, how both products were produced, the environmental impact of both, etc., and so forth. Check out those videos if you would like to. And ultimately, I've had nearly a year with Coconut Quar, and I promised a video once one of the videos got to 100 likes. We've hit 100 likes, so it's time to obviously make a follow up video. Now, I will say, start off right away by telling you I will be using peat moss till the end of time. And there's a reason for it. Number one reason being I am Canadian. And as a Canadian, the product that has to travel the least amount is peat moss. Therefore, in my mind, despite the fact that peat moss is no, not a renewable resource, it makes more sense environmental impact wise to use peat moss. If I use coconut coir that has to travel from the Southern US, Mexico, heaven forbid farther or from across the ocean, that just doesn't make sense. It's a lot of fossil fuels to move that product upwards. So peat moss is my poison of choice. Now, with that being said, I see benefits to coconut coir. And if coconut coir is something that you think is gonna work in your household, go for it. Even if you're a Canadian, go wild. So we're gonna be looking at a few factors. The first one being the drainage. The second one being microbial activity in the potting soil itself. Despite popular belief, microbes are very important with house plants and outdoor plants in container gardens very important aspect of a soil. And then thirdly, the issues that I noticed, um, in particular salt buildup. And we'll get into a little bit of why that may be. So like I said, I've been using coconut coir now for a year. Prior to that, I didn't use it at all. The brand I got is the black gold brand. It's a purple bag. I think it's made by, I don't know who it's made by, but it was, uh, chunky it was a little bit chunky so it wasn't super fine it had chunks of coconut shell in it not just straight fiber which is a good thing if you're an overwaterer so that brings me to my first point drainage coconut coir drains better than peat moss so for example when I was doing my coconut coir I used straight coconut coir I didn't put any peat moss or uh, perlite or pumice in I did straight coir and the reason for that is because I wanted to see how it drains. I wanted to see what's going on in this profile. And the best way for me to test it is just to use straight up product. So I didn't put anything into it. And despite the fact that I didn't put pumice, I didn't put perlite, I didn't put lac, I put zero draining anything in it. It drains very, very well. So like it's totally different than peat moss, you guys. Totally freaking different. Now, with that being said, if you are an underwaterer, coconut coir will fail you. You do not want to use it because you're going to have to babysit your plants way more than what you're used to. If you're an average person and you tend to your plants and you would characterize yourself as in the middle, then coconut coir, honestly, you may like it, you may not like it. You may actually find that you have to babysit it too much. So you may have to watch plants too much. And I'm finding as I'm coming out of the winter and going into the spring, I have to water the plants potted in coconut coir twice as much as the ones that are planted in peat moss. And the reason for this is the aggregation of the product. So the product itself has more macro pores in it than the micro pore setup of a peat moss. So peat moss has a lot of micro pores and therefore it works on a lot of capillary action. So things like bottom watering with peat moss is very possible because of the micro pores, it is able to go up against the force of gravity and ultimately fill the entire profile with water. Because coconut coir has more macro pores, there is a base level of capillary action with the smaller pores, but ultimately with the larger size ones, there are some air pockets in there. Those air pockets, no matter how few and far between they may be, help with airflow and ultimately help with evapotranspiration, which is just transpiration or evaporation from the profile, which means it just dries out a little bit quicker. So the second one is microbe activity. 
So because peat moss, it, we know, is actually harvested from the earth, it is biologically anaerobic for the most part, but there is some activity in there. It still has bacteria, fungi, spores, that sort of thing happening in it. Coconut guar, because it's a part of the outside of a coconut and it wasn't exposed to the soil, it naturally doesn't act very terrestrially soil-like, for lack of a better term. Now, this would have changed if I would have put in a manure or a compost. So with that being said, if you choose to use coconut coir, add a compost or manure. Do not do straight comp uh, coconut coir like I did, because it is biologically inactive. So what that means is that if I just watered the plant and I never fertilized, you will have nutrient deficiencies that hands down will happen because we don't have any nutrient cycling. It is pretty inert stuff. That's just my reaction. And the reason why I know it's inert is because my peat moss will get mold, my peat moss will get algae, my peat moss will get fungus gnats, thrips, you name it, it has it. And there's ways to manage those things. If you've been on this channel long enough, I welcome all of it because it means that my soil is alive and you need your potting soil to be alive. Indoor plants, outdoor plants, it does not matter. The soil has to be alive because those nasty microbes, fungi that you don't like the look of are important to basic fundamental functions of your plant, which include nutrient cycling, uh, predatory nematodes, they will kill off things like thrips, uh, fungus nests, that sort of thing. I'll leave an Amazon link down below for that, but you want your soil to be alive. It is going to be a burden off your shoulders when it comes to managing plants. And sphagnum moss, straight up sphagnum moss, is more alive than coconut coir. Coconut coir will not mold. I have tried, you guys. Unless there is a compost or a manure mixed into it, it is inert. There's nothing going on there. But again, it's not a terrestrial product. It is the outside of a, of a coconut. So it's not going to act the same. It's not going to have the same surfaces. It's not going to have the same amino acid profile, the same uh, carbohydrates, that sort of thing. So that is something to keep in mind. Just because it doesn't mold doesn't mean it's a good thing. So you're going to want to mix in a compost or manure and that, if you did that, is going to immediately take away from its ability to drain and its benefits of to a person who tends to overwater. And personally, if I was to use the coconut coir, I would actually do a 50-50 split. That's how inert I find it to be. Now, obviously there are alternatives to this, which would essentially be treating it similar to like a hydroponic or a semi-hydroponic setup, where you're continually adding nutrients every time you water, which is what I did in my case, and I didn't have those nutrient deficiencies because I was continually adding uh, fertilizer to it but if you aren't in the business of making sure you're fertilizing every time you're watering then you're gonna want to mix something into it now it could be it could be worm castings anything just something organic and terrestrial so you can add that nutrient cycling and just those very natural microbes that need to be in a soil profile So this brings me to my third point, which is salt buildup. Now, my lack of microbes, I personally believe it's because it's from a coconut, it's not terrestrial. However, the amount of salt that I had in my product, again, if you don't know why that is, check out the original video for coconut choir, but the amount of salt that I had on that, uh, in that product would ultimately deter any sort of microbial activity in your soil profile. And it's as simple as that. Like there was an enormous amount, you guys. It was accumulating on the surface of my pot, um, on the rim of my pot, on the surface of the soil, it, just all over. It's very salty, salty product. And because of that, maybe that's the reason why I didn't have fungi or algae or anything, because the salt concentration was so high, it just could not survive in it. So if you have a salt sensitive plant, such as a maranta, a calathea, anything like that, um, an epenthes, 
anything that's a carnivorous plant, I highly do not recommend using the coconut coir unless you can ensure that it is low in the amount of salt or how, if you can see how it was produced. That is going to be your staining grace there. Otherwise, yeah, it's gonna do quite a bit of damage. So I hope you guys found that helpful. Let me know in the comments down below if you use coconut coir or peat moss and why that may be. If you had the salt issue, if you noticed a difference between the two microbially, and all that fun stuff. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, and I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.